Another Lama gathering. Great souls, great hearts. Well, one of the things I'm finding also is that in my daily work, I don't feel I'm at liberty to reveal that I have a spiritual life. <laughs> reveal that, what? I have any religious convictions. <laughs> to reveal that I have a spiritual name. Uh -huh. Or that I have any religious convictions. Yeah. Or am engaged in any inner work. I mean, I feel like I really have to keep that. Yeah. My, my friend Jessica told me you can come out of the closet here spiritually. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, the truth. Right it. mm -hmm. It's the truth. Yeah. One hears about closet Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> closet this and closet that. Then do you ever find this interesting thing I do, and maybe it's because I work in social service field, I'll be being quiet about my thing, and then I find this woman who appears to be a, quote, straight woman running an agency, she kind of slips and says something like, it's sort of like a mantra, and I look, and then <laughs> we right. discover, you know, yeah. she's, she's taking her one-week vacation to go visit the huge crystal in Hawaii, and you would never have guessed, that's and right. then I realized that's how I appear to the world, mm -hmm. yeah. disguised as, mm -hmm. well, my goal when I left Lama was to try to become normal, to be a normal person, so we're all walking around so you never know oh there's a great merchant story about this when i saw him once i was looking out the window um, in mission street in his house and i had just had this extraordinary interaction with him and then i was in the living room which is a bay window that faces a park in a very poor section of san francisco i looked down the park and there was one of those old uh, bowery bums who was collecting trash in the park he had a kind of a piece of wood with a nail on the end and he would stab paper and stick him in this old paper box and just hunt around, walk around doing this thing. And then I looked closely and it was Mershi. And I, I said, never will I assume I know the hidden identity of a person because I saw an old Bowery bum teacher who had just, um, <laughs> had done this extraordinary transmission to me and then he went outside and he's picking up papers like a bone. So I, how did we get to that? Oh, our disguise in the world. I think we're all aspiring normals after we leave here. Yeah. We may never quite pull it off. Yeah, well, I don't want to be. No. Really. As Bonte says, the world is ass backwards, so you don't want to aspire too much That's to true. it. <laughs> but the neat thing is finding the allies. There's a lot more allies out there, I think, you know, and um, that's, that's, right. that's true, but I feel like, I mean, I think there are allies where I work, but it's sort of like, still there's a little bit of, you know, we're still yeah. not at ease with each other. Yeah. There's different level allies. Yeah. There's allies that support you on the physical plane, and allies that support you on the emotional plane, and allies, and then there's the occasional ally that can support you all the way up the line. They're all, it's all good, especially in the world. But it's not, there is something about the Lama experience mm -hmm. that allows a kind of brother, sisterhood. And sometimes you feel people with different sanghas, but um, more often than not, they're really the same because it's shared here in the totality of the humanness. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, it is more up and down the line. And it, to me, it really, the word family is really a, really comes into its own in this at Lama. I feel like Lama is my family. In some ways much more so than my blood family, though when I went home to England I found it that was it was just different. I've never known a family in my life like this. And it, I, every year I come back I continue to be reminded of that. Especially as it becomes an ex, really an extended family. True. And it's harder to find in the world. You have to really look at it very differently. In mind with that one thing I, I've been wanting to tell people here because I'm so grateful about it, and that is that when you leave Lama, whatever you do in the world, you're involved in what, you, in my profession, they call interpersonal. What do you call it? Um, inter, interpersonal skills or something like that. And, um, that people, when they have meetings and so on, they're not so skillful in the compassionate heart way that um, mm -hmm. it is here. And um, so I have this, I have a file of uh, recommendations when you're working with people, give you recommendations and so on. 
So when I'm not feeling too great about who I am, I read my recommendations, and there's, uh, you know, so you get this feedback. And one of the things that everyone says is she, on top of this and she does that, she has extraordinary interpersonal skills. And I st was thinking ever since this year, when I got another of those, where did I get those? Because I know I didn't get them in my family, childhood, upbringing, or whatever. And when I sat in on the business meeting in Lama on Friday, it suddenly clicked so clearly because um, I saw it happening, what we learned in the way of interpersonal skills here about really listening to people, you know, being able to be silent, knowing if you don't say it, someone else will say your thought for them, and if they don't, then you put it in. And all those um, abilities that you learn here are very useful, whatever sphere, I think, in the world that you're in. I've really seen that. Um, They're useful to the hardest-nosed mm. person. Yeah. Uh, too. I mean, I remember when I was, we, went, we decided we had to buy a house in 78 or we'd never be able to afford it again. So, <laughs> so I had right. to apply for bank loans. And, well, six years in a mountain community without salary in northern New Mexico. <laughs> I mean, what kind of a financial history is that? <laughs> That's right. So I had to compose a <coughs> incredibly hard-nosed description of Lama, which was completely true. Yeah. Right. Uh, Could you send us a copy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that would be I think there may be one on file. I mean, it, you know, something that would appeal to a banker's heart, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll send it. Yeah, I would like that. But, <laughs> but, it, but it was true. That's the Everybody that's the thing. It wouldn't leave. Part of your escape plan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get a little pack. Yeah. How to get a loan? Escape resume. How to get a loan? <laughs> yeah. What yeah. was? What that did it is, well, it mentioned group psychology, personal psychology, mm -hmm. personal motivation, um, um, management skills, uh, uh, basic skills such as agricultural mechanics and building and construction, organization, uh, project organization. I mean, all you know, the kind of stuff that everybody does in the world of business anyway. They just, you know, and we do it here not because that's what we're trying to learn, but because that's just what's happening yeah. and, yeah, and it turns out that it's it's extraordinary fine training for just about anything mm -hmm. one would want to do. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know there's another thing that <clears throat> being at this place for a time there is a transmission that takes place that has been <coughs> an unbroken chain now for 23 years that when you are here you participate in and in some sense, I think of it kind of like the Silsala, the Sufi tradition, that there is a transmission that passes from year to year to a wider group of people. And for instance, a year ago, we went to visit Joya in Florida. Mm -hmm. And that was a very interesting experience, but <clears throat> that's sort of beside the point. Because <laughs> at the Kashi Ranch, the ashram there, we met Mary and Joseph and Swaha. Uh, nearby. Who was the other lady? Um, I want to say Penny or something like that. Um, From we, here? we saw her in New York. Um, doesn't matter. But anyhow, all of a sudden, here you are in an ashram in a sangha doing very specialized work, but there are a couple <coughs> of old beings. <laughs> and something happens that the next thing you know, you're sitting around like this telling llama stories. <laughs> you know, it's just automatic. If you've been at llama and you bump into someone else that's been at llama, whether you were there together or not, what happens is the tail starts spinning itself out again. And, uh, you know, and even if we were here at identical times, our experience of this place is different. And so each person has their own story and their own perspective of what this place is based on where they're fit and where they're going. And Mary and Joseph, I think, for and I just remember Mary is the person who was me the first time the original center of the dome floor was um, done and, this, and then the second one which is what Mary and I did were done with natural mud she became in Tao sort of a person who would find natural mud colors from the area and do artistic work in the community and so we redid the design um, that way and she, they go way back I've always been waiting for a baby Jesus to come out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got Ramana. I mean, that's 
actually the year class. that Romana was born at Donna Hosley, which was at the time the school that at the time was run by uh, Lama. Um, we did a play, the kids. We wrote a play about the uh, the Jesus story, and Romana had just been born, and we used her. <laughs> 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 Good. Somehow, okay. well, I just remember sitting in uh, the prayer room one afternoon, and a couple of the kids came in, and they did a parody of meditation. <laughs> That's great. I mean, they sort of went <laughs> like this, and then they looked at each other and started giggling, and then they went like that again. And that went on for about ten minutes, and then they went out. <laughs> it was great. That was changing the subject, maybe. <laughs> Do people want to ask questions? Well, someone asked me to ask if there's a story behind the uh, body that's in the window in the garden. That was before my time. Asha was yeah. there. I mean, that was that may have come with with Steve and Barbara at the very beginning. Right. You should talk about the bells. Oh. Known origin of the that that big aluminum thing there on the bell. Uh, the one with the awful sound. The deep one. Great big one. The yeah. deep one. There's a, there's been a succession of those, and they always right. end up cracking. Those are made of aluminum, which uh, there was a physicist up here, and he pointed out that those are neutron reflectors, and that they have to do with increasing the efficiency of uh, nuclear fission explosions, and. Uh, <laughs> And so Tony Price, who's an artist in uh, in uh, Santa Fe, who makes atomic kachinas out oh, yeah. of scrap from Los Alamos, uh, <laughs> gave, uh, sold a huge set of bells to uh, um, what's the guy who made Easy Run? Who's that? Dennis, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. And Dennis Hopper gave them to Lama. So we had all of, we had this huge collection of uh, aluminum bells, which were scrapped from Los Alamos. And I didn't know about neutron reflection at the time, but we, there was one that was particularly big. It was, it was, it was about this size, and it came down about this far, and then there was a flange, and it hung by its center. Boom! I mean, it was really. Uh, and somebody said that they thought it was the casing for a thermonuclear device. Some guy came up from Los Alamos. And yeah. he thought it was that, yeah. And so you so hear it. it well, vibrated what, with what happened? So we were using all this stuff from Los Alamos for our bells <laughs> that Tony Price had got. And uh, one time, an F, uh, uh, occasionally the FBI comes up or some <laughs> government agent comes up to, uh, to check us out. The IRS came up one time and asked me about a transaction that they didn't understand on the audit. This guy, this this guy who was an FBI agent, was he was looked like he was about 60 or over. He was dressed in a western shirt and jeans and cowboy boots, and he had, <laughs> he had a cowboy hat. And he made some lame excuse for being there, like, "Oh, somebody escaped from the Springer detention facility, and have you seen him?" Well, that's not even a federal issue, so <laughs> that was obviously a sham. But he was friendly, and I I offered him a tour of the place. And as we were walking from his car to the door to the dome, and he showed me his ID. I don't. I didn't even look at it. Actually. I think it said FBI. In it. I, he said, "Well, what's that?" And he looked up at these bells, and I said, "Well, we think, or we've been told, that that's a thermonuclear bomb casing." <laughs> 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 and without a moment's without a moment's hesitation, he said, "Oh, swords into plowshares." <laughs> <laughs> so I felt that he was an ally, <laughs> and uh, he didn't stay very long. I mean, I think he was, I think he decided that we were straight because I was open to it, and and, and that his business was elsewhere. <laughs> so. How about the window from the? No, no, no. Airplane. 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 Airplane.
Cynthia West, who has been a grand supporter of LOM all along. Chris and Cynthia were the first similar kinds of people that we met in Santa Fe. Chris was selling holy pictures, bright colored holy pictures on the streets of Santa Fe, with, along with the Indians, you know, Ram and Sita. But to us, they look like these sort of blue gods with lots of heads, and they look really <laughs> weird. But anyway, that was what Chris was into, and he had a truck called Dr. Romero's Delivery Wagon, which was, has always remained my uh, romantic snake oil trip. But anyway, he, he and Steve <laughs> met while he was selling these pictures, and then we went to, to their house, and they had young children, and we were friends, and so they were very much a part of the beginnings of Lama. And Chris was, and they built a house down at Pilar Hill when we built up here. That, that house is still existent now. And uh, the train car? The box cars were there too. But, but at any rate, he had uh, stored those. It was Noradine last year that we talked about those windows too. Bu they're bulletproof. Which was? Thank God. Which one? The one from the military. The horseshoe. The horseshoe. The for airplane windows. Oh. Yeah, they're pretty. Yeah. But in case I'm wrong, I'm going to see Al Beers. So I'll ask him. Okay. Al Beers is another godfather of Loma. He uh, he was in the he was in charge of buildings and grounds at the University of New Mexico and installed uh, for the first time, uh, you know, underground lighting and I mean lighting for the campus and everything else. And, and then he he wanted to get out of that, so he made friends with Frida Lawrence, P. H. Lawrence's widow, yeah. and made an arrangement for her to donate the. Um, the ranch to UNM and got himself, made himself manager. <laughs> and he's been there ever since. That's right. Now he's, but, now he's like he, fighting it to the nail the all the time. Back of the ranch, you know, he's, he's I mean, I think they cleaned it up, but oh, yeah. behind the D.H. Lawrence uh, <laughs> memorial place, there was a tank, there were several backhoes, there were hundreds of thousands of spare parts for innumerable. Uh, pieces of machinery. Everything that was taken from the University of New Mexico that was no longer useful came up to the back of the <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Ranch. Right. And uh, two of the windows, I mean, actually those windows, well now they've probably been replaced, but the windows around which the uh, kitchen was designed uh -huh. in a big way were, uh, came from the uh, D.H. Lawrence Ranch, originally from UNM. And I just have to say one thing about the domes, because I don't know that we've gotten it in this tape. These domes. Um, Steve Bear had gone to, had founded Drop City, which was a, really, I think, the original hippie planetary drop in. It was on an old goat pasture up in Colorado, and, and Steve and I had gone through there and seen Drop City. They were doing solar heating with strange pieces of glass, and they took car tops and they built these kind of small geodesic domes, and there were about six families there who we ate and drank with it. Well, I guess we weren't drinking, but <laughs> maybe we smoked with them. I don't even remember that. But at any rate, they were quite serious, and it was a very magical little hobbit-like town. So that's how we met Steve Bear, because we'd heard about Drop City. So we came back here, and we were staying down at the SS Ranch Way at the back of San Cristobal. <coughs> and we had this eight-sided building started, I believe and the walls were going up, and we had decided what kind of dome to put on. And, you know, the dome, the standard dome was Bucky Fuller's geodesic dome, but it wasn't, it isn't beautiful, you know? I mean, it's dome-like, but it isn't beautiful. Mm -hmm. The facets aren't beautiful, mm -hmm. and so there was just kind of, it's not, you know, this hesitation, plus the fact we didn't know how to make it or anything like that, so. <laughs> A certain semi-experts would come, but nobody really knew how to go about doing it. And so we were just in a waiting phase. And one day this guy, Steve Bear, drives up with his wife and their kids, who were my, our kids' age, which was nice. And they had this little paper model that looked just like that and just like that. And Steve said that he and Ed Clark, this guy he had worked with, had been playing around with this new mathematical formula for building, which was called zonal polyhedra. And they had, at that point, been fooling around, and they'd gotten this dome. Well, he just hated symmetry. 
He couldn't stand cemetery. He said, I hated it, but we knew it was beautiful. We figured that guy, Steve Durkee, might like it. <laughs> so he was driving up to see what we were. Well, you can imagine. I mean, here we are sitting with this eight, half, eight you know, this eight foot pile of adobes and all this energy waiting for the dome. And it <laughs> really fit. And I have to say that. Steve came up with this group of people who were working around him, and we had a time of putting the dome up. I described it to somebody the other day, but it was so dramatic, I just have to describe it again. There was a, we put a cement ring around the top of this um, adobe, and then piece by piece the pieces had to be put on, and it was raining all week, and the generator didn't work, so they had to drive down to Albuquerque to get accurate enough cuts because pretty precise mathematics to get those big diamonds so that they'll facet into each other and also be structural, which was important, right? I mean, they couldn't be loose so that they would <coughs> wobble too much. So there were several trips down to Albuquerque and back and these big pieces of board and everybody's kind of excitement about this whole thing. So it went up in two days. There was a big tree that went right up the middle of it. A tree that was actually living? That no, it had been around. cut down. Oh, okay. Henry. Henry Gomez, by the way, was part of all of these processes. And we had a fireplace in the, um, in the only room, it was called then. <laughs> it was on that platform. And then we had the fires going, you know, and water, because everybody was so cold and coffee. That was where you ate and did everything else. And um, this tree was going up and was used for some kind of a support. But one by one, each of the, the pieces was put in. So the first there was this jagged line around the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next one started fitting in, right? These diamond pieces were going in and then screwed in slowly, slowly, slowly. And then the top first seven were put in, right? And, and nobody really knew if the last one was going to fit in. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it was a really precise kind of business. And so when they got it up, it came up out from the outside and we pulled it up from the outside and then it just and we cleared off all the snow, and everybody was kind of standing outside where they were doing it, and it, it went up, and it just went, <laughs> snapped in. There was just this uh. tiny little subtle click. <laughs> it was so great. <laughs> that was so great. And then Henry <laughs> sat, and I remember the sound of his um, file. I called him the bastard file. That Nobody else, else in the world ever calls him bastard file, but I call, it, call that axe doing well, he sat with his bastard, filed, filed his axe for a really, really long time before he went out there and, you know, I mean, it didn't have a skin on it, right? It was all transparent, so the, the sky still showed, and he just chopped this tree, chopped the bottom out of it, and then it was hanging, you know, and it swung back and forth and kind of tightened everything in. And then we got, a, we had a rope huh. hanging down that had been holding up this tree, and that, that was a swing that was used by all the kids for a long time, from the top, the top of the dome to the other side. And we did all our practices and everything in there, and the sun going across. I mean, it still does it with the, uh, with the skylight, but you can imagine how gorgeous it was to have this helix that went around mm -hmm. in the spiral. Um, I don't know how long it took us to skin it, but you were here. Four or five years. Yeah. Yeah. We spent a whole summer skinning it. We had to cut each. We had to fill in the uh, the big triangles to be small, and, and we had to basically we had to custom cut every single piece of plywood, which meant hauling up a four by eight sheet, marking it in place, lowering it, putting it through the saw, and then um, hauling it back up again. So we all, we had to learn to relax. In high <laughs> and so then when the fire happened. Sadiq who, uh, Sadiq, who was in Hans still working. Yeah. Ha Hans and Steve, who had been up there putting all that plywood on, were de up there with his teeny little holes. It was the middle of the night, and there was flames coming everywhere, and they wanted to save the dome. Obviously, it had been a lot of work, right? It was a tiny little flame. I was standing oh, there pregnant, watching them, terrified. But it, they did get the flame out, but the water pressure, I mean, they were up almost as high as where, where the water pressure was coming from. Mm. <laughs> well, the only room got fixed up. I feel that the reason that the only room burned up was basically because we had been doing practices. I think like somebody was describing their practices uh, through the through the 
I, I can't remember which discussion I was part of, but the, the, the winter practice in which people were trying to help each other but basically weren't helping, that was the first two years of our uh, sadhana was having these meetings. We had these wonderful spiritual meetings where the scapegoat got jumped on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there was just so many, I think there was just so many bad vibes in that room and too much life, too many people eating there and doing all of their stuff. And we were all to total jerks in terms of our consciousness. I mean, everybody, well, except with the exception of Sadiq. <laughs> sure. We're but, uh, well, he was smart enough to keep his mouth shut and kind of stay out of it. But we all sort of had flags the way. So it. So, but theoretically, it was because we had just finished this room and we had had a party to celebrate. It was like on the stage it is now to celebrate it, and somebody lit a match. And I guess the match didn't quite go out, but it went back into a closet. And there were some loose papers in it. And a, and, a, and a propane, a like copper propane light. Uh, uh, it must have melted uh, when the papers got on fire. Uh, uh, <coughs> but who knows? There was you know, another fire in the shower room, wasn't there? No, it was the same fire. Just one fire. It gutted the entire structure and, and started on the firehouse. The wow. I mean, the bathhouse before it was put out. Oh, it was quite a event. Kali. Kali, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wept the next morning just from the shock. I don't know if anybody here has ex experienced a big fire. Mm -hmm. well, the, tower. Uh, the tower. The tower. The tower was another example. Peter Adams said that when he rang the bells the next morning, he wept. Yeah. And he didn't know why. And it's, it's because Kali is right there, and you experience her in that destructive mm -hmm. aspect. Face on. And, and you're just reminded that everything you ever took for granted is up for grabs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to say that and to know it in your head, but it's another thing to be informed so clearly in your gut that that's the way it really is. When I was here, there was a forest fire down the mountain. Anybody else here for that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which was not on our land, but um, almost the major part of the crew that fought it for the first couple hours was the Lama Foundation. We all went down there. Basically, you fight those fires with shovels because you don't have any. Um, water down there and this incredible concentration that went on was one of the deepest teachings I ever received about my interaction with this fire. You just you get an inch this way and then it cuts somewhere else and you have your territory and it's like everyone clicked into action into this organizational process to protect the rest of that, that forest from burning, you know. It was extraordinary. I mean, uh, again I remember coming back at dusk when it was finally out and they'd gotten some of the what do you call those hired forest firefighters who were, they flew them in from somewhere or something, and so we got to come back. Smoke jumpers. Smoke jumpers. Smoke. Yeah, I don't know, something, somebody who knew what they were doing as opposed to us, you know, but, I mean, my Birkenstocks were melted. I remember that. <laughs> I remember, we, I think we were in a business meeting, yeah. and then a bunch of us jumped in the back of a pickup truck. Yeah. We didn't even, no, you know, fire on the mountain. Nobody was there to put it out but us, really. I'll never forget that feeling of intense heat on one side of the body and cool on the other. Somehow that's an image. Intense inferno heat and fear. Real primal, like, yeah. hey, <laughs> this is serious <laughs> stuff here. This isn't right. some, and when you, you know, saw someone fire, was in it, or someone out there. Get them together. Yeah, it was a real, yeah. All the fires here, I mean, the pottery yeah. kiln yeah, yeah. studio yeah. was, a, and they were all significant. And the, the tower was twice. Yeah. The tower. Well, I'd like to yeah, yeah, carrying the tower. The, carrying the water up to the tower. The no, tower is mysterious. Well, no one was living in the tower at the time. It was being um, renovated. I remember I was involved in putting up the insulation on the dome ceiling of the tower. And of course, the tower has a its its birth has a history that Asha could tell most effectively um, and it, it, it was discovered in the middle of the night. I remember Andrew's waking story. up hearing the bells. I, I was yeah. living in the upper dome at the time and I remember waking up in the middle of the night it was still dark hearing this cacophonous clang 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 and it took me a while to realize this was a distress signal it wasn't just part of my dream or something. And I woke up 
and got up and went out my door and there was this glow mm -hmm. happening over towards the north and instantly it said to me fire and so I pulled on my clothes and just ran down and went over there and already people you know were starting to mobilize out of their sleep and um, the tower was a torch it was just <laughs> straight up, up did it go? straight up into the sky it's hard to tell because the trees I don't know different now. but luckily it was windless there was no wind and it had been very windy uh, previously um, I can tell you because I it related to my pregnancy because <laughs> I, I think it was, was late. It was maybe it was late summer. summer. Yeah, it was late no, summer. No, it was right no. before I came to Mama. <laughs> end of April, because I had heard a few days earlier the tower was burning, and I was coming here a few days later. All right. Yeah, it was spring, and it had been its usual windy spring, and it was very quiet that night. And I remember we had a bucket brigade going from the. Um, uh, one of the holding ponds, both of the holding ponds there by the sauna. And uh, we had these backpack, um, five gallon square tin funky mm -hmm. things with little hoses on them, these firefighting things for when you live in the backwoods. And people were already starting to just mobilize whatever buckets, these backpack things, up the rocky little steep little path up there. And fortunately, we had among us several guys who had had a lot of, quite a bit of firefighting experience, Kim Myers mm -hmm. and Steve Hinton from down the road. Mm -hmm. The whole community just sort of came together. Mm -hmm. um, what was kind of ironic was also was that the, um, I guess the nearest fire department to us was the Quest of Fire Department, or some fire department would called and they said, sorry, you're not in our district. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Finally, bless their hearts, whoever came, um, the Quest of Fire Department, I guess, came finally with their 500 gallon or so water truck, but they couldn't get very near the tower, so it had to be on the other side of the arroyo there. And Spewing out the spaghetti line of the Hauser, the Hauser line, the hose, finally up to the tower, and that helped quench what the bu bucket brigaders had, had begun to contain the fire. So there were chainsaws and axes and shovels and all these firefighters who knew how to contain the fire contained it. And we worked at this and suddenly we began to be aware that it was starting to be dawn, it was getting to be lighter. And everything was just calming down, calming down. And the light rain began to fall, yeah. very light, yeah. very mystical, misty rain. And at that <coughs> time I felt like some kind of peace had, uh, had uh, arrived. But we were all in shock for days, weeks after that. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, thing that you can speak to as far as what the history around that fire was? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, it was very clear <laughs> what was going on. True confessions of the Lama. First, is it true that that was the first night in since it had been built that there was nobody staying in it? Well, it was being worked on. As Sarah said, it was being renovated. Peter Adams and others were involved in um, verithaning the floors and all kinds well, of things. So nobody no, was staying it, in it. Nobody there was in been it. Days, been it was okay. being converted okay. from So that was a pocket. It was being, a, being converted from being Asha and Nora's home into being a place that could Asha. be, or, well, they had separated by that time, to being... But it was still <coughs> a place. Yeah, it was still... You know, it still had the energy of having been their family home, and it was being converted to being rooms or sections so that different um, members of the foundation could live there. Yeah, and it, it needed updating. It needed a lot of work, and it was oh, it obviously needed a really lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of it. The actual, the, the physical cause of the fire was a spontaneous combustion of 
propane fumes because the pilot had not been turned off. It was the one mm -hmm. fancy schmancy <laughs> house that had gas. It had its own propane tank outside. Miraculously, it did not catch on fire. Otherwise, we would have lost the entire Kit Carson, I'm sure. But um, that did not catch yeah. fire. Mm -hmm. There was a, the green pickup truck <laughs> got all <laughs> burned up. Um, but anyway, it was a spontaneous combustion from the lowering the, the, the ground level fumes of this pilot light. I mean, of the verithane mm -hmm. and the pilot light mm -hmm. just in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And obviously, to all of us, um, there was a lot that really went up in flames that was really very combustible on an emotional level that, that, that burned. Somebody, sent, somebody <laughs> sent me or gave me this envelope from a leather trunk that had been under the house that I still have sometimes, you know, with an old Life magazine article and Steve's, a couple of the edges of Steve's paintings and letters from here and there, letters from the beginning of Lama. And I mean, this was a charred ruin. When I came back here, I think there was a women's meeting and Remember Zuleika sort of danced a phoenix out of the flame. Remember that song? Yeah. It was beautiful. Oh, but anyway, yeah. in this uh, this uh, leather trunk, I guess, which had melted too, but there had just been, it, I guess the fire had gotten out just enough so that there are these charred pieces of paper. I have, I'll probably make something out of them sometime. Yeah, and I but remember you did a purification. After some time, after the fire, you know, we just let it be. It just had to rest. Mm -hmm. And I remember sort of going up there and kind of sifting through the remains, and I kind of have a fascination for that sort of thing. <laughs> and there were these globs <laughs> of, um, uh, there was um, thermopane windows in the, in the lower level, which was solar designed to be kind of a greenhouse. There's a lot of um, very good materials went into that house. Anyway, this thermopane, had me melted into these jewel-like globs in it. It was the phoenix. Going through those remains was like the phoenix um, mm -hmm. rising up, these little jewels, mm -hmm. and lots of, you know, metallic stuff. And then many new years later, in fact, was it last year? Yeah, two years, years, two years, years ago. Years. Yeah. Sarah and I uh, sort of spontaneously felt like we needed to um, do some more healing on the area and we felt like planting, at least putting some energy into it so that maybe something could grow there. And uh, it was during a Vipassana camp, so there was silence everywhere. And that was a very kind of rarefied um, atmosphere to be doing this project for which we needed to get wheelbarrows over to the Wood pile to get some sort of composty sawdust. While people were doing zombie walks. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and we were giggling, <laughs> just <laughs> trying to so be mm, <laughs> trying not giggle between you know, the kitchen and there. We were and trying we to not talk. We were trying to be very focused, but it was so joyous for both of us that it kept spilling out. And uh, so we found these old seeds, grass seeds, and I brought up some new uh, flower seeds, and we just slowly in the course of the day, maybe 10 hours or so worth, took this stuff up there and raked, and it felt like we were massaging the land, and just around when it was getting to be sunset, we finished. We, we slept up there. We brought some pails of water up and kind of sprinkled and left it to God to Best whatever. And uh, did we sleep up there? <laughs> so is it growing now? <laughs> <laughs> did it grow? I, it Have you needs checked the garden? a lot more layers of soil renovation. <laughs> yeah, no, that's one of those I thought I perceived some little sprouts. Not my vision. I was going to turn it into a memorial park. Memorial right park. <laughs> 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 of what? It was going to be the. Um, Zoom Margaret Memorial Park. <laughs> well, we took some photographs. We did document it, thanks to we Sarah did. Morgan. And um, we put a lot of straw mulch on, and it just felt very yeah, golden, nice and tucked away. And uh, I, I thought I perceived a few little sprouts later on that summer. <laughs> but what was important to both of us was that we took care of what we took care of. And it still feels like that. I mean, I went up there yesterday. <laughs>
before the house was built, there was a lightning strike up there. I remember um, being the in fire. the yeah, being in the library, and I had just somehow learned there's these three kinds of energies that, that Sufi Sam talked about, or that his disciples talked about: Jamali, Kamali, and what's the other one? Jalal, Jamal, and Kamal. Kamal is sort of in between, and the, and what I was reflecting on was was the statement that if you're in a Kamal place, it's probably dangerous to think of anything but God. And I was just thinking that. I think I even mentioned it to somebody, and then somebody came down and said, well, there's a fire. There was this big lightning strike sometime. And then somebody so said, well, there's a the fire up there. It lifted up. It did. And fell over. Uh, so anyway, we fought this. Uh, we tried to put out this tree stump. And that's exactly where Steve wanted to build the tower house. <laughs> <laughs> and then years later, you said that Susie Gomez offered to do a ceremony to, to, to make it safe, because lightning trees are not exactly the, you know, there's a kind of energy there. Mm -hmm. And Nuruddin, Stephen didn't want to do that. I don't remember that. Okay. Well, the tower got hit by lightning a couple of times. Yeah, there was, there was a woman's there. meeting there yeah, once. That's right. There. Yeah, we were holding hands. Upstairs. Oh, you were that's in it? Right. That's a good description of Sakina. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were holding hands in a women's circle in the, the dome the upstairs of the townhouse when lightning struck. It was a, a very electric. <laughs> <laughs> Our eyes kind of rolled. <laughs> I remember being there with you with Rudrananda, that baboon guy oh, or whatever yeah. his name was. No, not Rudy, but the one who worked for Jim. Big Kundalini guy who came up along. I mean, uh, that what? big Kundalini guy. Part of the parade. <laughs> yeah. Asha, Asha held court in the, the upper part of the tower. It was fun. And amazing fun. things happened there. Right. <laughs> also, I remember that um, the one who discovered the fire that night when it ignited, it was a wonderful guy named uh, Andrew, Andrew. What was he called? Oh, Andrew Calvin. 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 <laughs> Calvin was sort of a Rastafarian kind of wanderer, and he was—he had been living in a tent, sleeping in a tent out there in that part of the woods. And uh, thanks to him, he was the first one who um, was aware that there was something very hot going on at the tower, and it was him who came up and. Went Thank you, Calvin. What I love about is that story about when Baba Haridas was here and there was something oh, happening yes. up at the reservoir and something in the prayer room. <laughs> <laughs> there was a guided well, meditation in the dome. In the dome. Yeah. He was leading a meditation. <clears throat> and I was up working at the, the reservoir site with a guy with a backhoe. We brought a backhoe up. We got all the walls completely up. They were completely finished all the way around, but there were gaps. So we had, were having to fill in the backside. And so we were doing it with this backhoe. And the guy up there was in a hurry to get out. He was behind time. We had exhausted him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to say the least. No. But anyhow, he had, he had just finished it all. It was all filled in. And he had this bucket full of dirt. And he had it lifted up. <clears throat> and. Somehow or other, he bumped the little control oh. knob, and this thing goes crunch down on the ground. And I'm looking, and I see cracks form all over this one wall. Oh my God. And the guy got out of the backhoe to see what had happened. He walked up, and he was standing on top of the wall. And I'm catacorner from him, so I can see these cracks radiating out with him standing on the wall. I knew it was going to go. Start making this mad leap and made a dive for him and pulled him off just as the whole wall went down. And at the same time, Haridas was saying, ringing bells like that could kill someone. <laughs> because the kitchen bell was, had rung just as the Right, the bell rung just as the whole thing went. <laughs> The kitchen crew was ringing the bells. Yeah, and Haridas said, don't ring the bell. In the middle of this meditation. Did Harry Dice like write that or what? <laughs> yeah. 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 So how do we know that the, the, the bell didn't cause the wall to crack? Well, well, well. All you know is well, things are connected. Yeah. But I mean, tell about um, the the crystals and stuff. Harry Dice's direction about 
putting crystals and stuff in the in the reservoir? Well, when we finished the whole thing, we got this plastic liner, which had, you know, <coughs> Sadiq and I had researched considerably to find one that would go in it. But before we put it down, we spread sand all over the whole bottom of the hole. And I don't remember specifically, but I know we had amber and some flags, and it seemed to me there were some quartz <coughs> crystals that Hari Das had told us the pattern to use. And I think, I can't remember who else, it was me, and I think it was Bhagwan Das was there, who came down in with us. There were like four of us, and I can't remember <laughs> who it was now. They laid out all these little goodies in the bottom before we dropped the liner in. So I don't know when in, anyone ever pulled up the liner, whether they found any of that stuff or not. The, flag, the flags um, had it printed on, on the, the liner. Sand. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I know the sand. But there were no crystals. I got the design. The <laughs> I, could, I, yeah. I could imagine that they had put that plastic liner under the silk screen. <laughs> <laughs> May have settled in the sand. I don't know. Well, they're still there, I'm sure. That's true. Yeah. Under the concrete the amber. Uh -huh. It was there were big round amber pieces. No, yeah. I don't think. No, oh, no actually, there, I they got dug out. <laughs> huh? We dug, we dug way down this time. Uh, you know, another connection between something a teacher said and, and then an event was um, the pottery studio fire. It was yes. the day after the annual meeting, and Ramdas was a trustee, I guess, at that time. And he was, I was thinking about Jonathan this morning giving this beautiful positive report on cottage industries. But at the time, cottage industries were sort of a joke. I mean, it really hardly did anything. It certainly didn't support Lama in any way. And Ramdas kind of blasted us for that, um, for not having our right livelihood together that day and then that night. The, uh, one of the things we were trying to do as a cottage industry at the time was pottery. And that night, the pottery studio burned down. Yeah. And Mika. Is Mika here right now? No. no. Listen, um, just that day, wasn't it? He took it on himself to uh, do a kind of a inauguration ceremony of, of the pottery. Or was that when the kiln was built? That was some. Is this it, was the kiln. Else? it was the kiln. It was the kiln. The kiln the when the kiln yeah, was it built, right, yeah, it, was the kiln. it was all completed, and Mika had had us all doing this fire dance, <laughs> this thing, you know, this the fire <laughs> dance. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a lot. Is give that the, wrong? Give the truth a chance. No. <laughs> <laughs> This is the lady who started us in pottery. Right. You know, we asked Henry, to, we, fire, we loaded it up and it was firing, and we asked Henry to come down and do a blessing. And one of the burners apparently had blown out, putting propane gas into the kiln, but meanwhile, maybe a pine needle or something had, there was a spark in there, and the whole door blew out. But it was all this very light brick. Right. We just sort of looked at Henry and said, "Good blessing, Henry." <laughs> <laughs> he was laughing. These <laughs> things. <laughs> so then, so then Mika decided to do this. Was that when that happened? Were you there? See now, my I remember the part that the night before, some of us were singing, and I remember Hod was there. We used to sing this song about Jesus, won't you come down here? <laughs> and then you'd put another Mary, won't you come? Buddha, and then somebody said Shiva, won't you come down here? And I just, I had this. I mean, I had to play around with Shiva. Well, you know, the same thing happened during the Ramdas camp, the first camp song, because it was Shruti Ram and um, uh, Krishna Das did a. A puja fire to Shiva out here, and they were doing. Um, well, I can't remember all the chants now, but they're all Shiva chants, real heavy, and they were saying, "Now, don't, don't mess around with this stuff because if you do them without, without being conscious, they'll cause fires." And Shiva a couple song. of days later, we were in the sauna, and everybody decided to start singing Shiva songs. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> sure enough, the sauna uh, caught fire. Uh, yeah. Mount, that Mount Madonna's main <laughs> building burned down the night of Shiva Ratri. <laughs> well, a few years ago. Yeah. Community. So, I mean, there's a lot of power in these spiritual practices. Yeah. That yeah. That's right. Spirit Sometimes not, we don't realize how they manifest on the physical yeah. plane. Well, you could call them not spiritual practices. You could
call them magic practices. <laughs> you know, I mean, if they are the level of magic, then that's what happens. It's stuff. Mm -hmm. What about that Buddha in the dining room? Yeah. 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 There's a Buddha in the dining room. Yeah. Yeah. The, gold, the wooden yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. You can see it. A woman named Alice, who was a student of, I think, Philip Capro brought that here mm -hmm. a long, long, long time ago and uh, felt good about Lama and she left it here. That was that's all I know about. It. And then it's you know, it's been up there ever since. But it was a very generous gift. I mean I think it's a valuable you know, I mean it was it seemed like a really nice one and, and uh, it was very generous of her because I know that she liked it, you know. Mm -hmm. Then she subsequently started a Zen center down at one of the earlier Zen centers, a Zen meeting place at Zen house. I don't know what happened to her. Can someone remember the story of the meeting be uh, between Grandpa Joe and Hari Das? Well, I bet it was silent. It was silent. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was told about it. I only, I only remember two things that I was told about it. And, uh, it was. I think it was most. I heard it was mostly silent, but but um, <laughs> I think Hari Das Baba asked if Joe liked being in this world. And Joe said, "Yeah, it's okay." <laughs> <laughs> and Hari Das said he he wasn't so sure. <laughs> 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 Something like that. That's all. Oh. That was all. Oh, I think we should just have a hold hands and remember Grandpa Joe. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I mean, Grandpa Joe is. Grandpa Joe was the father of Henry Gomez. He was a house Indian. He had a brother named John. He was a nice guy. He had eight sons, seven of whom were killed in Second World War. Uh, we always send our browner people to be killed in war. This country has generally done so, and they were all Marines. The Indians have a mythos that the Marines is the thing to be in, so they all go into the Marines, and of course the Marines are in the heaviest action. But anyway, Grandpa Joe had, uh, when we, around the time we met him, married a woman named Adrian Gomez. His wife had died, and he loved her very, very, very much. And he was quite lonely, and Henry and Susie were not feeding his needs. So we married Adrian, who really loved him, and they were a great couple. I and mean, he was tiny and kind of refined and sweet, and Adrian was this enormous Jewess with just a as booming, a per, as booming a personality as ever walked the face of Lama. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, knows the truth backwards and forwards. But when she was, when she looked at Grandpa Joe, her face was like a moon of surrender. Mm -hmm. It was sometimes to be with the two of them by myself. I, lo I was looking at Adrian's face and mm -hmm. I had never loved the way she could love him. Mm -hmm. And I've ver rarely seen it. And he, uh, he just blessed all of us. And when he sang in the Peyote Church, um, it was like your dearest dream of your fairy godmother and Abraham and, you know, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. It's like that whole, the whole range of vibrations were in these songs that he sang. And uh, he was up here a lot, just giving us a lot of support. And he'd always, after the meetings, he'd always, just go up to everybody and say, are you okay? You know, I mean, because his philosophy was that okay was the best you could hope for. <laughs> okay was just wonderful. So if you'd say, yeah, he'd say, good, because he knew how good it was. And one time I remember dropping him off at the Pueblo and we said good night. And then he, and I, then I watched, I didn't drive away, I started to drive away, but I was watching him and he flew up on the roof. <laughs> I mean, he, not with his arms, but you know, I mean, he was an old man. He moved slowly usually, but I mean, he was up that ladder in less than a second. I don't know. I couldn't see his legs moving, but it was just really amazing. He was just a, but that had, not, I mean, I don't, I wish I hadn't even said that because he, uh, he and his brother were assigned, I think, by their father to, uh, their father had gotten the Peyote initiation, which had come to the Indians in order to bring the Indian tribes together because they were getting so dispersed and so weak. So they had brought the uh, Peyote church to the Pueblo and were keeping it through. And they had, before they led meetings for us, they had led meetings in the D.H. Lawrence Ranch for D.H. Lawrence and all the hippies of his day. You know, they'd met at the, the uh, Branham's 
psychodrama center now. We had rented that as the, one of the first places that we stayed during the winter before we had winter housing up here. But I feel like Grandpa Joe's, um, not shadow, but his light, as one of the greatest and deepest blessings and invocations that has kept Lama um, <coughs> glorious. And, and you know, when you're, I remember him, it, it gets deeper. He said, is Grandpa here? He says, she says, yeah, he's inside learning how to paint. <laughs> was and he was in, a, but he was in his 70s. And we went in there and he was drawing uh, a picture of a horse. And he was teaching himself how to paint. And he came to Donna Hosley and he painted it there. And he also came one day and in my office he carved out these three deer, which I still have, just <coughs> on an old piece of wood. But the deer are alive, you know. I mean, they're just, they're really quite amazing. And then, he got into sitting in front of the TV with all the kids and coloring in coloring books. <laughs> <laughs> he would just sit and color in the coloring books while everybody was doing their number, like at last night at the, in the dome. You know, he would have been around somewhere, but he would have been doing something kind of like that. I remember sitting in the laundromat with all the machines going one time, and he just looked at me and there was this crazy noise going on. He said, respect the sun, your father. Respect the earth, your mother. This is where we come from. And at that point, I had ideas of the oneness, and they were so big that I couldn't hear what he was saying. And it's only recently that I have felt myself as a part of the crust of the earth, that my body is the earth, and that its life is fed by the sun, and that he was right on the mark. And it took me 20 years from the time he said that with all those clanging machines to know that that was the essential architecture of our being. Yeah. But anyway, I just wanted everybody to experience Grandpa. His picture, I saw his picture recently, I can't remember where, <laughs> in, the <laughs> in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I think I was behind the photographer when he was in that picture. I mean, that picture just before peyote meeting. I just want to say that that picture is true. The, the person behind it was squeaky clean all the way through as far as everybody who knew him could tell, and he was funny. I remember one time I went, and this is sort of shocking part of it, but one time I went to his house, and he and I hugged a lot, and so I picked him up, because he was quite small, and I picked him, and I put him in my arms like this, and he started going, <laughs> <laughs> and Adrian's standing at the door, because she was always mad at me, because I was too friendly with Grandpa Joe, and she said, well, what do you expect when you treat him like that and turn him on? <laughs> <laughs> Adrian's so great. Adrian's still living in Santa Fe. Yeah. She, she and I have been pretty close friends over there. Yeah. She's years. painting now. She's and she's nice. painting. She yeah. went to UNM she's and studied art therapy. She hasn't finished her work on that, but her painting is really incredible. She's been through a lot of personal struggles, but she comes up every once in a while. And if she comes up, please lay out the red carpet mm -hmm. when she comes up. I have an experience around that photograph of Grandpa Joe. I never knew him in the body. But one time while I was living here, I took that photograph and looked at it for a real long time and started to do a pencil drawing of it. And it's one of the most um, uh, very high experiences of my life was doing a drawing from that photograph. It's a very deep thing for me. And I ended up giving that drawing to somebody. But my memory of doing it is uh, just quintessential experience. Amen. Oh. Grandpa John was looking at, well, one time, there, I think it was Ron Bess's first camp here in 1975, and there was somebody at the parking lot to ward away unwanted visitors. <laughs> and Grandpa John came up with a young Anglo couple. And whoever was there, Joe's brother, um, Grandpa Joe's brother, and, uh, and John, John walked by this guy as if he didn't exist. And the two people went with him, and they came up. And, sat down by the kitchen steps and 
I had learned, somebody had told me that, well, you know, when one of those guys comes up, you offer them water, coffee or something. I mean, you've you got to offer them something. So so I, offer, I brought him coffee, and, and then he started to ask me what was going on here. And uh, so I tried to tell him, you know, Ram Dass and what we were doing, and we were, you know, sitting, and we were talking, and he was talking to people, and I don't know. It, it wasn't highfalutin or anything. I was just trying to be as straight as I could. And I said, would you like to meet him? And he said, yeah. And so I, you know, I worked it out. And I, I didn't see John again, but it was very clear to me that he was coming up as a guardian in this place, mm -hmm. that that's why he was here. He was going to make, he was here to make sure that we weren't fucking up well, and, and that this guy who was running this camp was okay. I want to say one thing more about the prayer. Uh, the prayer room, which was um, one of the first things that we made, and we were all digging this place out, right? I mean, we'd been around New Mexico, and we wanted we wanted some kind of a kiva. So there were a lot of people. There were a lot of hippie girls in the water doing the mud, and weren't really really covered, and certainly didn't have the whole Indian way of looking at things. But about some weeks after we had started, these Indian men came up and they had heard we were making a kiva, maybe from John, you know. Uh, but they came up and they took Steve aside and they said to him, we have our way. You don't have a way. Don't take our way. You must find your own way. You know, I mean, that was really a very strong message of theirs, that they didn't want us stealing their ways. Because then later I heard these stories about how they, they, the, the Indians at the Pueblo had lost their capacity to fly physically. And I don't know whether that was leaving their bodies or what. When they started letting American anthropologists into their kivas mm -hmm. to take notes, and as soon as that, the, that, as soon as that work started happening, the anthropological work, they felt like they, they lost their power to fly, and we got these big machines that flew in the sky. <laughs> See that, wasn't it? Well, but I just wanted to say that about this prayer room, because the making of the prayer room was a very wonderful experience. It was a very wonderful thing for them to come and just make that clear, because I, did, I do think it had a very strong effect on our behavior because the Indian's way is so strong and we were into the peyote church and and you know everybody was a peyote boy in some kind of a way and that that would have been a very strong temptation on our part to take that way which I don't think would have served nearly as many people you know as what has happened which what has changed? to do we, we still don't have our way but <laughs> 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 it's a continual unfolding Asha, did the keep change the form of it the prayer room, please. Prayer room. <laughs> we stopped calling it a kiva that day. No, I think it's, I don't think it's ever changed since the beginnings of it. It's never felt any different. It's, ne it's always been the same. It's, a much, it's much more refined now in the sense that the surfaces aren't dirt. And there used to be a fireplace with which we heated, which was terribly inefficient. And often there was a whoosh of cold air coming through to feed the fireplace, so then we had another heater, but I think it feels, don't you feel, I think it feels the same as it did when we first finished it, and its concentration has remained really quite clear. We had 24 hours of Omani Pudgy on Ron Bass's first visit. Oh yeah, we got into these 24-hour chants. And, and, and of course, there were times when there was only one person who was capable of keeping the chant going. Mm. Yeah. Then we did them in the pond dome, too. I mean, we've done a lot of 24-hour dance. We had a lot of energy for that kind of stuff, yeah. There's another um, an Indian story that um, this reminds me of that happened during my era, and that was probably 78 or 79. 
Um, well, we had a weekend with the New Mexico Solar Association. I'm not sure that's the right title, but it was, it was the New Mexico Association of people who were really developing solar energy and alternative energies, and that was, you know, the wave of the future. And all the good guys were into solar in, in those times, and it was like, and it was clean, and we weren't we weren't raping the earth and all that kind of thing. And so, their uh, weekend conference was held at the Lama Foundation. And on Friday or Saturday, um, Grandfather David Monogli, who is, um, was the, the grandfather um, spiritual head of the Hopis at the time, came up the mountain and he's come to visit a number of occasions. And he just came up with someone driving him. And since he was here, of course, the New Mexico Solar <coughs> Association people said, wow, this is so wonderful. Could he just address our group? So he agreed Saturday evening he would address them. And I certainly don't remember his words, but basically he got up and there was an anticipation that he would be very supportive of this way of honoring the earth and, and uh, going solar. And he stood up and he basically said, be careful. And then he said, have you asked permission yet? Mm -hmm. and no one had thought of asking permission from the sun to be on the moon. So then I learned by asking permission of the water, you know, all those. Does that link in with what Rashad had always taught about intention and asking permission? I'm sure. Yeah, asking permission. There was also something about the danger of harnessing too much of the sun's energy. You know, there was some actual physical phenomena. Yeah. Kind of put a real <coughs> stop to the, I mean, not a stop, but a, a consciousness to don't take for granted that anything is free or that anything is without its laws and its spirit. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is is anyone does anyone know the story of the feather the feathers up here in the prayer room? Did, did, did they come from Grandfather David? John. a question. I heard that one of Nuruddin's intentions was that all of the buildings and all of the work here be temp designed to be temporary so that it would keep the work always and they would always have to be worked on and kept up. Is that just a story? Is there something to that? It wasn't the idea they were going to fall down, but it was the idea that you had to maintain your consciousness of everything that was constructed on the land all the time. You, could, you didn't put something up <clears throat> that would just sit there 200 years, that, that everything needed tending. And by tending, you kept remembering, you kept conscious about what you were doing. And if you made it too permanent, you'd forget, and then you'd get soft and lose concentration. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> Except it didn't allow much time for some other things, which may be equally important. <clears throat> Years. When I finally came to Lama, though, there was no transmission of that. Oh, and I know. for years, mm -hmm. the, everything had been band-aided. Right. You know, there was, I don't know when that was lost because it's wonderful to hear that now. But when we came, it just seemed like it was patch job after patch job after patch job. Well, there, you know, the whole layout of the buildings, not only the dome but the ISC and all of that, were according to a big plan based on an alchemical um, <coughs> whole system of alchemy. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, the Lama symbol, right. the sun and the moon and the valley and all that, you know, there were bars and other things present that we took out very carefully to, you know, Nerdy wanted to keep something secret. But yeah. one of the, you know, 
when you read the thing at Sam's grave, it talks about in the last day the sun shall rise in the west. <clears throat> the part of that whole complex over there was the notion that when the sun rose on the last day, the light from that sun would go straight through the ISC to Sam's grave. And of course, now there's no window in there. That, it's all blocked off, so that vision can't manifest. But it was designed so the sun's rays would come right down that corridor through the dome, the prayer dome, through the dining room, all the way to Sam's grave. And, and there's a, that little circle at the head of the uh, center of the uh, alcove there, which mm -hmm. is where it's supposed to continue going right. through. But that wall's been okay. built, so now... And, you know, it's funny, <coughs> when the prayer dome was being planned, um, there was this whole discussion about whether the doorway between the uh, kitchen area and the dome should be open or not. And I had very, very strong feelings that that was supposed to stay open. And it was um, decided to close it so that the energy in the prayer dome would remain uh, focused for prayer exercises. But um, it prevented the free access back and forth into the kitchen area and so on. And I, I forgot, um, I didn't realize that that was part of uh, what needed to stay open with it. And if you know, and the same thing was, you know, there was a, when the firehouse was here and the, the oh, yeah, chimney the was up, there was a hole, there was a window through there that goes from the window up through it. Oh, yeah. And if you get an aerial map, if you drew in the buildings and you, because this window is lined up with the summer solstice, the IC is lined up with the winter solstice. If you draw those two things, there's an intersection which is considered to be the heart of Lama, which probably no, or very few oh, yeah, people yeah, yeah. even know about anymore. Where does it intersect? <laughs> I've sworn to secrecy. Oh. <laughs> but it's easy have, enough to figure it a, out. We do have an aerial map. Miriam, yeah. remember that aerial photo of Lama? Do you remember that? Well, I've, I've been kind of planning on doing another aerial survey yeah. because um, when Ben and Tim came up and we were talking about the whole permaculture plans and the land use plan, they strongly suggested to do aerial surveys to get a picture of how much impact is really on the land and those kind of things. So. It would be great to include some of those other kinds of ideas in there to, to sort of give it more llama heart, you know. Yeah. 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 The thing with the sun and the moon, because recently Lance, who's doing the production at Flag Mountain, asked me about that, the bar, you know, that was taken out, and what I thought about putting it back in, putting back in the alchemical symbol. Oh, yeah. See, part, yeah, and part of the whole idea was that this side was one of those symbols, that side was another of the symbols, and the union of those two, I mean, that was part of the original plan of the ISC. And, um, you know, because the whole design of the ISC is like a crucible, you know, with a, a little thing in the end, and that was the notion of the cells, you know, to be even more of a pressure cooker than the land itself. I, but sometime back, well, when we went up, when Jamil and I and um, we went up to uh, Linda's farm to talk with Keith Critchlow about the design of things, at that time, one of those old plans, there was the drawings, that Nur, actually, was Nurgle um, didn't draw them, um, yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't Yahya. Yeah. Caduce. Caduce. Caduce drew them. Mm -hmm. all of a sudden surfaced, and I hadn't seen one for years, and I haven't seen one since, so I don't know if those are still, still around anywhere still of the ISC. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a symbolic design of the ISC, yeah. not the physical yeah. design. Yeah, I know we've got yeah. I had heard that toward the latter part of the Holy Wars, it was the removal of the bar between the two symbols on the Lama uh, design, Immediately upon removing that symbol, the tension subsided. Is there something to that? Well, I don't know. I did the flag, first llama flag design. I did the first silk screen. And when I did the screen, Nerding and Shaida told me, take the bars out. And that, so far as I know, was the first time they had been removed. And, and then um, they were in when I came, which was at the very end of the Holy Wars, and the year following Nerding leaving the mountain, Nika came <coughs> to the circle wanting to take them out again, which we did. 
So they, that means they were in, that's interesting. They got put they back were in at put some in point. Again. That's right. Uh huh. And then yes. taken out again. And now they're going to become allies. Mm -hmm. Speaking of old relics, um, you know, national, there was a Japanese National Geographic photographer that mm -hmm. took pictures here. Wonderful pictures. I don't know, does Lama have a, are those stashed anywhere? I see Boy, I don't even remember what year it was now. It might have been 73 or 74, I can't remember. Um, but they're great. Locate a copy. <coughs> I don't remember his name. He was a Japanese photographer. Was there a story on northern New Mexico or communes? Or what it published? Oh, it was published in the magazine. I can't, I don't remember the story of him coming up. Story. Right, but it was a long time ago. And Lee Driver and a bunch of, some of the real old people were in those pictures. 76, 77. That the one year that the ISC was functional as an as an Islamic center was an incredibly powerful year. I mean, I had been in Jerusalem and I had met Nurdin and the whole crew, Nur Isa and Ahad in, in Jerusalem and had um, come back from Jerusalem to be at the ISC with them at the uh, Islamic. Sufi center there, and at that point it was still kind of in transition from their taking on Islam and um, <coughs> deciding to follow it, but there were still all these incredible zikrs going on, I mean these very orgiastic <laughs> zikrs, <laughs> that's the only way, I mean the breathing and the power of the uh, male energy was so intense, I mean it just uh, was pretty... Um, amazing to be part of it at that time and it had its own it had its own life and the um, the practice of Islam was actually very very beautiful I mean to me it, it meant a great deal I mean it's so ironic that what I went through being Jewish and my family was in Israel and there I was in Israel and I met them in Israel and joined together with them lived on the Mount of Olives in this Arab village um, where the group had come from Chamonix to Jerusalem to do Murshid Sam's work, to start a Sufi center in Jerusalem for Murshid Sam, to, uh, to join, to do the peace work there. And what they were doing is, this was kind of like a magical pilgrimage. It was like the magical journey to the east because here were about 15, 20 people, half of them Europeans, and we, they had rented this large old Arab house on the Mount of Olives, and were just kind of making contact with people. You'd walk on the street in Jerusalem and some some person would sort of feel drawn to the group and invite them to their home and then from this one connection would lead to another to another. And so the group had been introduced to various Sufi sheikhs who lived in Jerusalem. There was Sidi Sheikh Muhammad and there was Sheikh Hassan up in Nablus which is about an hour and a half drive from Jerusalem, and we all went up there together and visited him and did zikr there. And um, Christian monks and Jewish rabbis, and basically what they were doing at that time was compiling information on the inner holy Jerusalem to make a book out of it in order to support the peace project. And this other Sufi lady named Benefsha had started a garden uh, in Jerusalem, in uh, Bethlehem, and then there was a um, I forgot his name, the guy who was doing a theater project with Arab kids in an Arab school there. And um, we would have these Shabbats in the house on the Mount of Olives, um, incredible Shabbats, um, with many of the Arab neighbors invited. And um, amongst the things that happened there were passing the wine mouth to mouth. <laughs> um, but, and that was the first time that Ramadan was done together was there. And the whole inspiration for the Islamic energy um, combined with the Lama energy was, um, was real beautiful. And um, I came back here, well, most of the group left and came back uh, to Lama and spread out. And, and then Ahad and I came back here a couple of months later 
uh, two days <coughs> before the Ramdas camp was supposed to begin. And uh, by that time, Nuruddin had become very committed to, you know, that Ramdas was very unholy and, <laughs> and that it was real. Um, anybody who was involved with him had to leave the grounds. So there was a caravan of about 10 cars, and all the people who were working with Nuruddin at that time, all the people who had been in Jerusalem, had come here. And we went to the Chama River and camped out for about five days. And then came back on the very last day of uh, Nuruddin's, of, of Ramdas's camp and walked in and the dome was filled with all these Hanuman pujas and you know, all these puji people and you know, it was like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> um, but that year, um, the, the Muslim prayers, doing the prayers in a line together was a real symbol of social unity. The whole process of having been hippies and then taking on some of the practices like washing your hands, the, the ablutions and the purifications and the prostrations that were involved, and also some of the social laws about sexual behavior were very important in a healthy way, I feel very strongly, for be because people were coming to terms with not just being all over the place anymore. And so there was a certain kind of a rightness about it. And, um, I ended up being in this ironic position because Ahad had been Nuruddin's closest companion and friend and helper, and I was married to Ahad, and there was and, and Ahad, as the holy wars happened, just you know broke off contact with Nuruddin totally. But I still <coughs> felt really drawn to the practice. I just I needed who I was at that time. I just needed to do these purifications and to put my hand, head on the ground. I mean, I'd spend hours prostrating. And it was like, as the separation kept happening more and more, it was just so painful to be going back and forth between one place and the other. And to feel um, the purity, something about what Nuruddin's heart was, what the intention was yeah. that had brought him to that practice, and the heart in it that, um, that really had a certain quality of knowing, of connecting to God through that. And, and then all this outer crap was happening about the formula of religion. And Nuruddin was writing to Wali Ali and to Pir Vilayat and telling them how screwed up they were and that it, the only way to become true to practice was to take something on in its ancient traditional depths. And that the traditional ways had an esoteric secret and the knowledge of that esoteric secret was contained in the form, and that by taking on the form, you would be transformed by the form. And that as long as we were being hippy-dippy, take this from here and this from there, and do whatever you want, you're in the position where your ego is controlling your spiritual work. Mm -hmm. And it was on that basis that he felt very, very strongly that you needed to surrender to your spiritual practice. And, um, in essence, without his personality and his ego, on that basis, that, that information um, affected me for very, very many years in my relation to spiritual practice that I really had to surrender to something larger than myself in order to be transformed by it. And I still tremendously value what Nuruddin gave on that basis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's been a very guiding force for me. And I think well, eventually, practically. what? Practically here. Um, he's in <coughs> Egypt. He's in Egypt. He's doing his wife for both teaching. I mean, what his stance is, has he completely followed this through on this path, and is he still so uh, extreme in his attitudes? Well, to a certain extent, he's gone through some changes. I mean, I, I haven't had too much contact with him, but in his heart, he was a really big lover. He was a lover. And <laughs> that was, um, he had uh, people close to him who loved him and supported him. It was almost like a harem at times. But then in this period where he kind of cut off, he was being very, very proper. And he wouldn't even relate to women at a certain point. I mean, like he wouldn't, there was one time when he just even wouldn't say hello to me. Um, and he was so fierce. And of course, he started the whole center in Abiquiu. And, and lived and worked there and those who wanted to 
went and started a whole new community in Abiquiu, which is not very far from here. And some of the people who lived at the ISC in that time are still there. Abdurraouf, who was married to Shireen at the time, and Nizama and um, Abdurrahman and Rahma, um, and a number of other people are still living there and practicing Islam in the way that they took on. Um, but Nurdin <coughs> has been with different teachers, different sheikhs. I, I've been told that he softened recently, and I, mean, and I don't know. There's something on the board over here about some interfaith spirituality conference, and I thought I saw his name up there. Does he go by the name Sheikh Noor? I don't know. I don't think he does. No, he's yeah, not in this country and, and doesn't come to this country much at I all. just want to say about, Bart, when you were describing the Jerusalem experience um, and the beauty and the, the convergence of that, I really felt that and was drawn to that when I became involved with the ISC project soon after I started living here. And I guess it was 70... Um, maybe the spring of 76, and uh, there was magic. There was a lot of magic around really making the ISC a habitable and beautiful and well-formed and constructed place combined with the, the practice of Islam, the prayers, and the teachings. <coughs> and there was a lot of life that was going on amongst this circle of people who had been in Jerusalem together. And I was so drawn to that because I have also spent some time in Israel and, and Jerusalem and Kibbutz. And to me, it was a rebirth in myself, another uh, convergence of the ways. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very wonderful to participate in that mm -hmm. activity before things, before the separation became so severe. Mm -hmm. um, within the Lama community. Mm -hmm. There was really a lot of beauty and magic in it. Yeah. And it's, it's there, it's invested. Mm -hmm. I feel. It was, it was a focus. Um, it's like being on a magic carpet. Yeah. The carpet was always talked about as, you know, you're on the magic carpet. Yeah. And when I, f when I first came back from Jerusalem, the ISC was really a shell. There were no doors and there mm -hmm. were no walls. There was no stove. We used to heat up water in a pot that, that was this big on the stove in yeah. the center. <laughs> and the tarpaulin was hanging across the doorway. Right, and everybody came and took their showers over at the Lama um, community. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting because in the Lama community, um, at that time, there was no sort of time for men and time for women to bathe. Everybody just sort of slept in there whenever they felt like it. And that was fine. That's what was happening. But the presence of Islam brought a certain respect for the um, observance of there are many things that males and females do not do together. One of them is washing. And, uh, <laughs> and so arrangements had to be made. This was part of the interface between the new thing that was um, growing at the ISC that was different and separate from the greater Lama, Lama community. So arrangements were made that when folks from the ISC came over to bathe, there was a little sign up in the rostrum that said something like, you know, men, <laughs> men are using it now, or women are using it now, or something. Um, so it was one of the, one of the rocking and rolling <laughs> things that, uh, became more increasingly more of an observance here of the bathing thing. Mm -hmm. And then there started to be the men's saunas and the women's saunas. Yeah, right. R E S P E C T. Fade to black, as we say in the uh -huh. video yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs>